Say reversed. reversed. The word actually means to completely turn about in position or direction. Reverse. To spin it around, to shift your direction. Psalms 118 and verse 24, this is the day that the Lord hath made. We will, say we, we, will rejoice and be glad in it. One of my most favorite scriptures. Perhaps you can quote it as I did because I cannot read the prompts. This is the day. So you can't quote it. Okay, I was waiting for you to finish. This is the day the Lord hath made. Not I, we will rejoice. Because praise is never independent, it's always corporate. This is the day. You see, this is God's day and it's a gift to you. This, right now, is your moment and you're not promised another. So you must seize what you're given. Actively grab what is your moment. This is the day. This is the Lord's day. The Lord created it and included you in it. And that in and of itself ought to get you up out of the bed with a spring in your step because this is God's day and you get to be a part of it. So if I was you, I might shift my perspective and stop fussing about your day because at least you got a day. If I was you, I might change my attitude about how I face the day because the truth is you're not promised this day, but God has been good to you and given you the day. So the psalmist said, this should be your response that you get to be included in the plan of God. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice. The word rejoice in the Hebrew is the Hebrew word gul. And this is what you would understand to be the meaning in the Hebrew. You ready? To spin about under the influence of violent emotions. So your response to the revelation that God controls the day, not the president, not the government, not the who, not the CDC, not the, the bank, not, 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 not your mortgage company. This is God's day. And the sooner you realize God's in control of your day and you get to be a part of it, the less you'll allow the enemy to manipulate your worship and your praise because your response needs to be the, the answer of, whoa, it's God's day and I get to be here. We will rejoice and be glad. You know what the word glad in that particular passage means? It's, it's the Hebrew word samach. And here's what it means. To cheer up. Perhaps you could cheer yourself up today. It, it, it said another word you don't hear very often. To be gleesome. G-L-E-E-S-O-M-E. To be gleesome. Look at somebody and say, be gleesome. Happy. So let's say it in some one way they mean to understand it. Say, cheer yourself up. Is there anyone here that would just reverse the trajectory you're headed right now? You say, how do I do that, pastor? Stand up and just spin around. Anybody willing to just change it? Thank, thank you, Gary. Oh, thank you, Lyric. Just, just, oh, there it goes, yeah. So I'm just gonna turn it around. I'm going to reverse the direction I had. So, so, so all of you that did it, stand back up because you're going to get a blessing nobody else did. Here we go. Ready? Here you go. Some of you are cheating. You didn't really spin. But you're trying to get on on the special blessing. Here we go. You ready? Say this with me. Say, my future is about to turn around. Now spin it around. Does it really work that way? Sure. Faith is the substance of things we hope for and the evidence of things not seen. So why doesn't everybody just stand up and say, you know what? My future's about to turn around. My marriage, my money, my family, my home, my life. This is God's day and you get to be a part of it. 
this is God's day. Now, tell your neighbor as you're sitting down, say, God will stand with you through every change. I, I hope you know God is right when you were wrong. And God is strong when you are weak. And God is faithful when you are unfaithful. And God is holy when you are unholy. God is righteous when you're unrighteous. God is stable when you're vacillating. God is here when we stray. And it is upon that integrity of God that we build our faith. Because our faith isn't built on a man. Our faith is not built on a preacher. Our faith is not built on a building. Our faith is not built on a denomination. Our faith is built on the integrity of God. So maybe I need to remind you again. My faith isn't built on a man. My faith is built on God. My faith is not built on a denomination. My faith is built on God. My faith is not built on people. My faith is built on God. My faith isn't built on money. My faith is built on God. My faith isn't my health. My faith is built on God. And in the, within the integrity of God, there is a loyalty, a loyalty so strong that it's beyond human comprehension. And it's really hard to preach about something for which we have no metaphor. What is the metaphor of God's loyalty? In fact, 2 Timothy 2 and 13 said, if you believe not, he abided faithful. For he cannot deny himself. When I am unfaithful, he is faithful. When I am inconsistent, he is consistent. Well, how do you then create a metaphor for something you've never experienced? Because no matter what we go through, hear me clearly, we've never seen anyone be as consistent as God is consistent. We have marriages that last 50 years and then they end in divorce. We have family members that stay with us 75, 80 years, but it always ends in goodbye. But God never says goodbye. He never divorces us. He never walks away from us. He never betrays us that's why he said if you're unfaithful he is faithful and i love this phrase in second timothy 2 and 13 for he cannot deny himself you know what that means god can't be anything but god and because God is holy, God can't be unholy. Because God is righteous, he can't be unrighteous. Because God is consistent, he cannot be in inconsistent because he cannot be something he's not. We try it all the time. We try to be things we're not all the time. We fight all the way to church, show up at church and say, praise the Lord, good to see you. Because we pretend to be things we're not, not God. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is always what he is. God cannot change. God isn't faithful to you because you're cool. God isn't faithful to you because you dress nice. God isn't faithful to you because you're kind to people. God is faithful to you because God chooses to be faithful to you because he cannot be unfaithful to you. God's word will stand. God is faithful. I wish someone believed me that the pieces of your life are about to be reversed. You say, Pastor, it can't happen. The mountain's too big, the difficulty too large. One sermon can turn everything around. One active word of faith can bring an alignment and shift the details of your future, your destiny. I don't know, anybody ever had one word, one altar response, one worship song, one Sunday, and you went home and everything was different? I forgot to welcome my sister. I thought about having her testify, but my mama, when she testified, she used to get out in the aisle and go, wow, and dance all around and scream. And so my sister's just like my mama. So I decided not to let her testify. And then I forgot to tell her that I'm glad she and my niece are here. Took her three and a half years to get here. Thought she loved me. But for someone in this house, the curse is about to shift. Something is about to reverse. Name and name and name and name. And how many kids have been learning about naming? Yeah, you think you've heard everything about naming, but watch this. Naming, according to 2 Kings 5 and 1, put it on the board behind me and put it in really big letters. Naaman was a captain of the host. Naaman was a great man, the scripture said. 
the captain of the host of the king of Syria, a great man with his master, honorable, because by him the who? The Lord had done what? Had great deliverance. He was a mighty man of valor. He was an accomplished man. He was a successful crusader for the king of Syria. His resume was impeccable. He was a man's man. He was the heartthrob of every girl. He was the envy of each man. He was tough and strong and victorious. He was used to acknowledgement and fanfare because he was a victor, not a victim. He was strong. He was powerful. Everything about Naaman spoke success. A five-star general. He led the army, a great man, highly regarded, the scripture said, in society, but he was a leper. Everybody has one of those, don't they? But he was a leper. A great Christian, but a talented singer, but a really great marriage, but a really intelligent person, but. You see, leprosy in biblical days was a skin disease, a disease of the skin that slowly spread about through lesions and sores, ending in deformity and often death. Leprosy was an incurable disease. Leprosy struck people in spite of their education level, in spite of their notoriety or their accomplishments or success, in spite of your financial prowess. When leprosy came, it evened the playing field. In spite of the rewards, the plaques, the accomplishments, Naaman was a leper. And a leprosy affected all of you. It wasn't just the quarantine required. It was the pain, the contagion itself. You were contagious. And it ate your flesh over your body over time because leprosy was a communicable disease, highly contagious. If you got too close, you caught leprosy. And as the disease progressed, you had to isolate yourself more. Naaman could not interact with his family. He could not serve his king. It would be too dangerous. He could not walk with his army. He could not counsel with his generals. In fact, according to Mosaic law, he was required to declare himself unclean, unclean. We spoke of it two weeks ago on breaking protocol. Labeling yourself by your past afflictions. Unclean, unclean. Would it be most shameful if you had to walk in the church and say, addict, addict, adulterer, whoremonger, thief, burglar, hateful, gossip, We could try it, I guess. (laughs) Paul said such were some of you. Don't pretend you're all whitewashed now and we were never that. Don't pretend you've forgotten what it was to be lost in sin, but the goodness of God came in and redeemed you from your past. Because if you ever forget where God brought you from, you'll be okay without worshiping. When you forget what God's done for you, you can sit in your pew and judge the music, judge the sermon, and and scale it on a one to 10, not as good as last week. But when you remember you were a bondman in Egypt, when you remember you were lost, but grace found you, when you remember God saved you from your past, you know what it'll do? It'll put a song in your heart. It'll put a skip in your step. It won't matter if you like the music. It won't matter if you like the lights. It won't matter if you don't like 
like people of other colors around you, you know what will happen? The praise will start bursting out of your spirit and you'll find yourself loving everybody, worshiping to any kind of rhythm. You'll find yourself losing yourself no matter how long service is. When you remember, I was a sinner, but the grace of God came and he rescued me. If God saved you, shout yes. Yes. Their condition labeled them. And can I say something to this church? This will not be a church that labels you by your past. This will not be a church that labels you by your failures. Oh, I understand that there are grievous errors in your past, but there is also a great measure of God's mercy that is undeserved. And that's what reconciliation, restoration, and redemption is all about. Saving me from my past. So don't you let the enemy tell you that this is a place that lives in judgment. Absolutely not. You walk in here with a new page on your life and begin again to serve God. What's it like to live with labeling on your failures? And some of you, you don't declare it out loud, but you tell yourself. And that's what keeps you out of the altar. Failure, inconsistent, not good enough. Can I remind you, you don't get good and then get God. You get God so you can become good. Listen, you, you can't get good enough. Your righteousness is as filthy rags. You can dress it up. You can try to talk it up. You can try to live it up. But until you give yourself fully to God in surrender and repentance, you will not become good. It is only by his righteousness that you are made righteous. And you got to decide. No more holding back. No more limiting my Myself. We refuse to place a limitation on your destiny because of who you used to be. And that ought to make somebody scream in this house. I'll say it again. I will not put a limitation on what you can become because of where you've been and what you've done. Because if Jesus refused to do it, I refuse to do it. Lepe- lepers were castaways because they were dangerous. This man was a leper. Something so wrong in his life, it messed up everything that was so right. But he was a leper. I say it again, something so wrong that it messed up everything that was so right. Leprosy. What is your leprosy? What is the one thing that's so wrong, it's messing up everything that is so right? What is the one thing that is messing up all the good stuff going on for you? Well, I feel the Holy Ghost right now because the Spirit's trying to speak to someone's spirit. You're successful in your career. You got your finances under control. Your educational achievements are great. You can hand out a resume that is impressive, but you got to leave one thing off. One thing. And it's keeping you up at night and tearing up your body and undermining your faith. And you can't function like God wants you to function because there's this incurable situation, it seems, living in your life. I don't know what it is that drives you under the anvil of shame and frustrates you. But hear me, hear me. One little blight that's affecting everything else. A great man, but he was a leper. But today we're going to reverse something. Today, the one thing that's undermining our future, we're about to see the Spirit of God reverse it. You say, Pastor, it's not that easy. Absolutely it is. And I'm gonna show you how through the life of Naaman. We're told in verse two that one of his battles, he took a Hebrew slave girl. In one of his battles, and that slave girl, seeing her master suffer, under the scourge and the pain and the disease of leprosy. Seeing the instability, instability hit the home and the frustrations. That little slave girl who if anyone had a right to withhold hope, she did. If anyone had a right to be bitter, she could have been. Because she knew a solution that would radically change his life. And she could have kept it to herself and watched the man that took her from her family suffer. She could have said, serves you right, you evil man. You stole me from my parents. You destroyed my city. You you took me from my home. So suffer with your disease. God, save us from the spirit of vengeance. 
Save us from the spirit of retribution. Hear me. The battle is the Lord's, not yours. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Because if you hold on to vengeance, it will kill your ability to rise spiritually. And it will eat like an emotional cancer in your heart. Regardless of who's wronged you, get past it. Regardless of who's afflicted you, regardless of what pastor disappointed you, regardless of what family member lied about you, do not carry the spirit of vengeance in your heart or it will eat away your conscience, it will eat away your peace, it will destroy your hope because you will spend your days focused on them getting what they're due and you will miss getting what God has planned for you. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost speaking to someone right now. Don't you spend your days and you say, Pastor, I'm over it. I'm gonna tell you right now how to tell if you've forgiven. You ready? This is it. If every time their name comes up in a conversation, you feel compelled to tell the dirt you know about them, you haven't forgiven. I'm gonna make it plainer. If every time the name comes up, you want to belittle them because you know something ugly about them, you haven't forgiven them. The tongue is a weapon that will destroy your future and theirs. You reap what you sow. Why don't you make a decision that you will be the kind of person that the gossip never is traced back to you? That when they start trying to figure out who said it, it'll never come home to your house and you're the one that repeated it. If you live with vengeance in your spirit, it will cause war in your emotions and in your own home. So one of the ways you know if you've forgiven it is if you feel every time Robert Tisdale's names come up to say, Robert Tisdale doesn't wear ties when he preaches. (laughs) Then you're not over it. If you feel compelled to say, since he's been here three and a half years, he's gained so much weight. You're still being critical. The fat is the Lord's. Leave me alone. That's what it says. Blessed and highly favored. That's what I am. Blessed going in and blessed coming out. How you know? If something in you, when their name comes up, turns over. Mm. If you feel the little flame of irritation when they say the name. Mm then you haven't given it to God. Forgiveness is not a gift you give them. Forgiveness is a gift you give yourself. You give it to yourself by giving them forgiveness. Whether they receive it or not is not yours. It's a little bit like preaching. I can preach a great word from God. It's up to you whether you believe it or receive it. I can't control that, but I gotta do what God sent me to do as my mission. So I preach it. If you believe it, great. If you don't, you're judged by it, not me. I'm judged whether I said it. But now understand that's the same as forgiveness. When you give forgiveness away, it's not your responsibility that they fall on your shoulders, wash your feet, and give you a big kiss. You know what? You give forgiveness away because you free yourself because as long as you hold the anger you're in prison and anger according to Proverbs rests in the bosom of a fool and this little girl this little slave girl kids that you've been learning about she had a faith listen to this this absolutely is incredible to me no one according to Luke 4 and 27 has ever been healed of leprosy no one in the Old Testament has been cured and a slave girl who has no previous experience with the disease of leprosy being removed, finds the faith to believe that the incurable can be reversed. And she said, I wish my master, the man who owns me, who I feel the Holy Ghost right there. Maybe I ought to say something. Get over the fact that people have owned you before. Get over the fact that people have harmed you. Get over the fact that they have abused you and you can withhold their healing. Perhaps their deliverance is in your hands after they've wronged you. And the miracle that they could get from God is being held by your vengeance and your retribution. But when you let forgiveness go and you release the word of healing into their life, perhaps that's what brings about the entire about face in their life. Ever thought about that? That their deliverance is wrapped up in your attitude. We don't like preaching like that. 
Just tell me, pastor, jump on one foot, spin around and I'll be healed. That's the kind of preaching I want. No, I want you to understand what you release from yourself has the ability to radically change someone else's life and deliverance. And a woman who was a slave said, I've been owned and stolen, but I won't be bitter about my past. God save us and save this country from being bitter about a past. Save us from being bitter about things that afflicted us. Save us from being angry about situations in our lives. Save us, Jesus, because there is an angry spirit in this world. And if you're not careful, you'll adopt it. You will make it akin to your spirit and you will pull it into your heart and you'll start being angry about things. Some of you are angry about people that are already dead. And they are controlling you from the grave. They're dead and gone, but they are controlling you from the past. And you can't get to the altar and have deliverance because you're still angry about what they did. Reverse it. You don't have to have this day, but God gave you this day. This is the day the Lord has made. Let's reverse it today. And a slave girl found the courage to say, hey, wife, if you would send Naaman to the prophet, the prophet can heal him because I know there's a prophet that can deliver him. How does she know this? Is it possible you have the ability to believe for something you've never seen happen before? Is there any believers at Tampa Life that call this place home that you could believe for something you've never experienced or seen in anyone before? Or does your faith only work where you've seen previous evidence? Anybody can believe for cancer. Here, we've had dozens of people healed of cancer. But can you believe for sickle cell when you've never seen anybody healed of sickle cell? Can I just preach a little bit? Can you believe for diabetes if you've never experienced anyone healed of diabetes? Can you believe that someone can come out of a multiple affair transgression and have a marriage healed when you've never seen someone come back from those difficult situations? Where does your faith have its limit? I'm challenging someone right now to believe for something you've never seen happen. You may have never seen children come back from what your children are in, but can you find the faith to believe that God God will bring them back. Woo! You may have never seen God heal a child dealing with sensory issues, but we're watching one right now, aren't we, workman family? We're watching one. Stand up, uh, Alicia. Matt, stand up. Jensen. I can't remember all the details, but when he was new and born and, and, and growing and maturing, you found out he was having a very difficult time speaking, am I right? Being vocal and connecting, and where is he now? He's in a normal second grade classroom. Did you hear that? Normal second grade classroom. So can anybody believe that that ministry will run out of students upstairs because the power of the Holy Ghost keeps healing their mind, healing their body, balancing their chemicals? Ha! What can we believe for, Tampa Life? Is there a little slave girl in this house? Oh, hallelujah. Is there anyone in this house that you've been through some difficulty and people abused you and owned you and stole you and manipulated you, but you can get past it and believe for the supernatural? If you can believe for something tough right now, I want you to put your hands up and say, God, I've never seen this happen, but this is what I'm believing for. This is what I'm believing for. Right now, I don't know what you're asking for. Maybe you've never seen a marriage healed like the one you're, that's in trouble, like yours is in trouble. Maybe you've never seen someone find stability uh, and never seen someone battling the emotional distress they're battling, but they come back to normalcy. In the name of Jesus, I speak faith over this congregation to believe for the impossible, the incurable, and the unlikely. I pray for some slave girl that's been through trouble and difficulty, that's been down a road of abuse and sexual transgression and difficulty to rise in her faith and say there is a God in Israel. Why don't you say it right now? There is a God in this church. 
Say it, say it. There is a God in this church. Come on, little slave girl. I don't know what atrocities you've had. I don't know what difficulties you've been through, but the God I serve can do anything. (laughs) Hallelujah. Go and have him pray and it'll cure you of your leprosy. Can I tell you something? You better connect to the right people in your life. Separate yourself from people that don't believe God can do anything. If you're friends with people that believe God has limitation, make some new friends. If you're friends with people that are afraid to say God can heal your family and all they want to do is advise you about the next medical opinion, find you a friend that can fill your family with faith. We have... We have boxes and boxes of pictures. My mother loved pictures and my sister came here not to really see me, but to go through all the family pictures that I had in boxes. She's going through these pictures and my, my sister said, who are these people? And she'd say, I'm just throwing them away. I have no idea. These are not relatives. These are not family. These are not people related to because everyone loved my mom. They called her Mama T. You know why? Because she was a prayer warrior. And it used to make me mad because people would call the house and say, Mama T, pray for me. I told this one lady, I said, no, she's not going to. She's my mom and she prays for me. Because when somebody really knows how to touch God, everybody wants to be their friend. Can I tell you something? You better get a friend in your life that'll look past their troubles and say, God can do anything. You better build some networks. You... you, You want people that think like you around you. You want people that tell you you're right all the time. And the Lord says, nah, I'm gonna put a little girl that you don't even have a reason to listen to and I'm gonna make your situation so desperate you'll grasp at a straw for any kind of miracle because it's breaking you down. God will put you in a situation that you gotta grasp, that you gotta reach for the impossible because you were not where you needed to be completely. Get connected. Get connected to the right people. You need to evaluate the relationships in your life. And if the relationships in your life are not bringing about the healing you need in your life, you need to stop wasting time with people that can't lift you. If that friendship's dragging you down, then you know what? Step away from it unless you're lifting them up. It is really good, but nobody's listening. You'll go right out and be friends with the same losers you were friends with before I started preaching. (sighs) Break up with the boy. If he won't come to church and you used to come to church, dump him. Do you like practical preaching or you want me just to play games? Looks like I've only been preaching 12 minutes. I can't really tell. If she don't want to serve God, what are you doing messing with her? So you know what Naaman does? He hears the word and he runs to the federal government. He runs to his king. Says, hey, king. There's a prophet. Yeah, say that king. I heard it over there. Hey, king, there's a prophet that can heal me. And the king says, okay, let's get a bunch of cash. Let's get a bunch of money. Let's throw a bunch of money at your problem. Can I tell you something? Money ain't going to fix your problem. Your your problem's only going to be fixed by submission and obedience. And the king threw a bunch of money at the other king and said, hey. And the other king said, what are you doing to me? I can't fix him. All these money, all these animals, all these jewels, all these crowns. I can't do it. He said, but I'm paying you to fix my general's problem. And he said, am I God to kill and make alive? And Naaman says, send him to me. Because there is a God. And Naaman shows up, all important, on his beautiful animals, with his entourage with him his horses and his chariots, and he knocks on Naaman's door, and Naaman won't even come out of the house, and he gets offended. Mm. Gets offended, gets offended. 
I told you a few weeks ago that offense must come, that offense will come, that offense, listen to me, is a happening, it's an event. Being offended is a decision. People are gonna do ugly things to you. You're gonna call pastor and he's gonna hit ignore. It must have happened to you, huh? Yeah? Amen, pastor does it all the time. They made, they made me get a new phone because my old phone, the button broke on it and for a year and a half, it would never go on anything but silent. You turn it off silent and it said silent on. Turn it off, turn it silent on. It just turned on all the time. Never rang, never text. It was the best phone Apple ever made. <laughs> now I got one that rings. So I keep it on silent. <laughs> Pastor's gonna hit reject. And you got a choice. He rejected it. Do I get offended or not. Offenses are gonna come. You're not gonna feel like people love you or heard you or blessed you or listened to you. And your choice is to choose whether you're gonna get angry or not get angry. But Naaman was ticked off. Send your servant out here to tell me what to do. Do you not know who I am? Since when did who you are matter to God? Don't get so intoxicated on your own self-importance. Drunk on the wine of your own accomplishments. I'm important. I'm necessary. I'm integral to God's plan. No, you're not. And I thought surely he would come out here and wave his hand and stand over me and say hocus pocus and the leprosy would be gone. But you had the audacity to send someone out here and tell me to go dip in a dirty river in Jordan when I can go back and dip? I can go back and dip in the rivers in Syria that are twice as clean? I'm done with this ridiculousness. I listened to a little slave girl. She deceived me. It was all a plot and a, and a ploy and I'm mad. I took all my money to the king. He sent it to the other king. They sent me to this little hovel in the wilderness. That means house. They sent me out here to this little junkie place. Well, that wasn't for you older people. That was for my kids there, you know. Sent me out here to the junk, and that man has the audacity not even to see me face to face, wouldn't answer his phone, wouldn't respond to a text message, sent his secretary to tell me something. Gustavo, don't let him get mad at you. Because sometimes he delivers my news. Says, the pastor says this. People get mad. No, I want to talk to the pastor. That's the way Naaman was. He wanted to talk to the prophet and he's sending Gehazi. Boy, God knows how to work you over on a Sunday, doesn't he? And Naaman is leaving. And Naaman's servant says, hey, did you forget the reason you came? Didn't you come here because you're dirty? and you don't want to get in a dirty river, don't forget the reason you're in church is because you were dirty. You didn't come to church because you were clean. You came to church because you were dirty. So don't act all clean now and sanctimonious that you're really holy now. You got here because you were a wreck. You were dirty. You were a mess. You're going to know what? I was raised in church. Yeah, you're dirty too. All are born sinners and fall short of the glory of God. All. We all came to the house of God because we were broken. You're not here because you were clean. You're here because you were broken. It's not your goodness, not your success that determines the outcome of your miracle. Listen to me. Your importance does not matter or dictate the parameters. But we lose sight of our, listen, problem because we don't like the process. I came to get a miracle, but you mean I gotta go to the altar? No. I came to have a healing, but you're telling me I must be baptized? No. I came for God to help me, but you mean I gotta open up and invite God into my life and receive the Holy Spirit and speak in other tongues? No. You mean I gotta change my life and quit drinking and smoking and dipping and running with girls that do it? No. No, give me my miracles with my parameters, not yours, God. 
Don't ask me to change my life. Don't ask me to dedicate my spirit. Don't ask me to come to pray first. Don't ask me to tithe. Don't ask me to dedicate. No, give me a miracle, but give it to me on my terms. That's what Naaman said. No, I will not dip in that dirty place. And the servant said, you forgot why you're here. You were dirty in the first place. What does a dirty river matter? Don't forget, how many times have you walked away from a miracle because you didn't like God's process? Because it was old fashioned. It was outdated. It wasn't hip, dope, or cracked. For all you people over 20, that's how we talk, okay? That's how we talk. Can I tell you something? Naaman wanted a life change, but Naaman didn't want to submit to a process he didn't understand. Listen, the reason why Naaman had issues with Jordan is because he didn't understand Jordan. For him, it was a dirty river, but for Elijah, it was the place where God did miracles. It was Joshua the priest stepping in with the Ark of the Covenant and the waters parting immediately so the people of God could walk across on dry land and go into Canaan. Hear me. It was the place where the axe head floated and found a way the iron to come out of the water. It was Elisha and Elijah at the Jordan where the miracles took place. If Naaman only understood Jordan, then he would have seen more than mud and more than dirt. You can't see how good the church is because you're so offended by your own self-importance. If you could understand really what the altar could do for you, you couldn't stay out of it. If you could see past the flaws, listen to me, of the church and see the God of the church, you would completely change the way you worship. Hear me, sometimes you have to overlook the people in the church to connect with the God of the church. People like to say, there are so many hypocrites in the church. And I agree, there's a bunch of them. But where do you think we got the people from? We don't make them in here. We don't, we don't make them in the church. They come from out there. So you're out there with a bunch of hypocrites too. And liars and whoremongers and adulterers and, and lasciviousness and violent people. And we come in the church and we bring all that in because the reason why we come to church is we're dirty. We're here because we're dirty. And if you could ever see what Jordan could do for you, you would run to the altar. You would run to the baptistry. You're angry at the prophet because you think the prophet, listen to me, has a lack of respect for your achievement and, and all of the things that you've added that are integral to the processes. But hear me, it's about to cost you your deliverance. This is your test. Will your self-importance, your arrogance, your pride are the parameters on how you think it ought to unfold and how it takes place, limiting you from experience the dynamic power of God's presence? Surely all that emotionalism isn't necessary. I can come and listen and get just as much. I don't even need to attend the house of the Lord. I can get just as much staying at home. I, that, that scripture, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. Even more so as the Lord comes. That wasn't written during a pandemic. Huh. You really want to go there? Well, yeah, they were only burning them and murdering them and cutting them in half. I'd call that a pandemic. Baptism. I don't need to be baptized. I'm just going to believe. I don't need to pray in tongues. That's all right. God wouldn't require that of me. Since when has God ever made sense to you? <laughs> Since when has God ever asked your permission if you like the process? People like to tell me, well, if it was good enough for my grandfather, it's good enough to me. I don't need all that stuff. Why is the only place you apply that standard about religion? Your grandpa didn't have an indoor toilet either. But you got one, don't you? Your grandpa didn't have a cell phone, but you can't go a day without one, can you? 
your grandpa didn't have air conditioning in his automobile. I think you should turn it off all the way home all week to, to line up with your grandpa. Oh, by the way, he didn't have a car, walk everywhere and work in the field six days a week from sun up till sundown. You don't believe that stuff about I'm not doing it because my grandpa didn't except when it comes to God. And you are limiting your own spiritual experience by your grandpa's spiritual experience that you don't even have firsthand knowledge of. I wouldn't let the process that I disagree with keep me from embracing everything God has for my destiny. And it's getting hot in here. (laughs) Embrace every new thing God has for you. That was actually a joke. I was talking about you getting uncomfortable with the grandpa stuff. It's you. Deal with the leprosy that is limiting your life today. Reverse it. You're not too important to give your heart to God. You may be too stubborn to repent, but you're not too important for God to heal you today. Don't miss the moment because of the attitude. If Naaman could see the Jordan for what it really was, he would have seen the place that God shows off. If you could see the church for what it really is, the altar, the baptismal, if you could see it for what it really is, it's the place where God does his deepest, most beautiful works of the Spirit. Raise your hands all over this house. But if you don't know where God shows up, you'll hold on to your old ideas. If you don't know the place where God shows up, you're gonna believe your own concepts. You're gonna bring the world's perspective to your life. If the world's ideas were so good, you wouldn't be dealing with an incurable situation. If their concepts were so good, you wouldn't have been dealing with an impossible situation. You need to lose the restraint and confront the issues of your life. Stand to your feet. If he'd have given you something hard to do, Naaman, you would have done it. Why don't you just do something easy, Naaman? Do something easy, Naaman. Do it. I don't have time to finish. I wish I did. But Naaman, in his response, don't let your dignity keep you from solving your problem today. Because until obedience has been completed, you cannot expect the supernatural incursion into your circumstance. Did you hear me? Go dip seven times in Jordan. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And until obedience is completed, you cannot expect the supernatural incursion into your situation. You say, well, God, if God will give me strength, I'll do it. No, you do it and let God give you strength. You say, well, when I feel to run to the altar, I'll do it. You'll never feel like giving your heart to God. You gotta do it and God will meet you there. Well, when, when, when I feel like worshiping, I'll worship. Start doing it and God gives you strength. Listen, obedience will cause God to reverse the situation to the level of his sovereign will. Stop arguing with God. What is your leprosy? Say these two words with me. Say radically obey. Whatever deliverance, and this is a prophetic word for some of you in the house, whatever deliverance God is going to give you for the thing that will not go away, the deliverance will not happen until you adopt radical obedience. You must have obedience to the end. To the end. Come up here, Roman. You must have radical obedience until the end. Play Naaman for me. It's crooked. Dip seven times. One, two. Did he have a miracle yet? Three. Miracle? Four. Miracle? Miracle? That's six. It had to be complete. I had him do it because I couldn't bend over like that today. (laughs) It had to be complete obedience. Because if you partially obey, you won't see the hand of God in your life. Obeying God, listen to me, from a position of passion and not duty should be the norm for you as a believer, not the exception. Failing to obey God is always disobedience to God. 
You don't get points for partial obedience. You get points for full obedience. Can I tell you something? Delayed obedience is immediate disobedience. You can walk away naming, or you can dip <laughs> seven times. Now, you ready? Last, in verse 14, and I really wish I could have preached a whole section today, but I'll let you go. Watch. When he dipped seven times, the Bible said he cleansed him of his leprosy. He cleansed it. You ready? He dipped himself according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh came again like unto what? Look at that skin versus this skin. My sister looked at me as only a sister can and said, you need Botox right here and right here and right here. <laughs> but look at that skin. Look at that skin. <laughs> it wasn't just a healing. It was a complete restoration and reversal of the disease because complete obedience doesn't just get you a miracle complete obedience gets you a reversal 51 15 he went from an old weathered man of war to skin like a baby handsome clean fresh Dis yes I called him a baby Zach yes okay he was clean. Because God doesn't just want to heal you. He wants to take you back to what you were before the failure and the disease ever hindered you. Can you believe with me? He doesn't just want to heal you and you still have the scars and the scabs. He wants to take you back as if it never ever happened to you. Some of you, you believe this pastor. God's wanting to take you back at the damage never even happened. You say, pastor, how do I get there? You fully immerse yourself in the plan of God obediently and God will make it all right. Raise your hands all over this house and love God. God reversed it. And it was like he began again. And this is what he said in verse 15, and I have to close. Watch verse 15. Put it up. 2 Kings 5, 15. Put it up there. He says this. I didn't give him this verse, my, my, my hesitation. But watch this, watch this. He says, but now I know. Because the miracle was so transforming. Now I know. I love this part. Oh, I, I wish I wasn't hurrying. He said, now I know there's a God in Israel. And hey, give me two buckets of that dirt. Give me that dirty river. Because everywhere I go, I'm going to take it with me and make an altar out of the dirt from what God did. I'm going to take it with me. I'm going to take it to my home. I'm going back home with it. I'm going to take that dirt everywhere because the church, the Jordan was so important to me. I can't ever leave it. Even when I got to leave and go somewhere else, I got to have it with me. Because I know that there is no God in all the earth, but in Israel, I know there's no other God. So give me a bunch of that dirt. I didn't want to mix myself in. I'm taking it with me because I never want to leave this moment. Your hands are raised and your hearts are open. Jesus, I'm praying for someone in this house right now to make a move toward full obedience. I'm praying for someone right now to choose to serve you obediently, without restraint, without hesitation, to run to you. I'm praying for someone right now to say, all I have is yours, God, ever in my heart, my soul, my mind, no more on the edge of obedience, no more partial engagement with your spirit, but I'm gonna take the restraint, the resistance, the hesitation off my life, and I'm about to give you all of me, God. I'll dip, I'll obey, I'll surrender because you're gonna take me someplace I hadn't been in a long time. You're gonna restore my life to before the tragedy, to before the disease, to before the heartbreak, to before the issues in my family. You're gonna put it all right, Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I speak prophetically over someone's life right now. God, take them back before the scars. In the name of Jesus, as they surrender their heart to you, 
set them free from the pain and the disease and heal their thoughts and their spirits in the name of the Lord right now at home and in this house let the spirit of God impact someone listening in the name of Jesus oh if you're ready for something to shift in your life you need to come if you're ready to see something reversed something turn around something change come on right now yeah there you go guest members alike you're coming You're coming, don't hesitate. The Spirit's trying to break through someone's life. If you've never received the Holy Spirit, you need to come. If you've never been baptized, you need to choose. If you've never repented of your sins, you need to repent. Come on, that's it, that's it, that's it. There's been all manner of layers of the Spirit speaking to people right now. So I'm asking every person in this house to deal with the one thing that messes up, the one wrong thing that messes up all the right things. I want you to deal with it right now. Go ahead, talk to the Lord in your words, with your pursuit, with your prayers. Deal with the one wrong thing right now. Deal with the one broken thing right now. Deal with the one thought, the one attitude, the one activity, the one mistake. Deal with it right now. Come on, that's it, that's it. All over this house, we're dealing with things. I'm gonna ask you to do something a little crazy. It's just a faith exercise. You ready? I just want you to go down a little bit on your knees and come up. We're gonna do it seven times. And I'm gonna believe when you do, you don't have to go all the way down, just a little dip. But when you do, I'm gonna believe something's gonna break. Yeah, count them out yourself, two. There you go, there you go, that was two, now three. Yeah, just bend a little bit, and then four. Yeah, there you go, and then five. Come on, that's it, and then six. Something's gonna change, you ready? In the name of Jesus, then seven. In the name of the Lord, in your obedience, something's gonna change, something's gonna shift. There's gonna be a miracle in your money, in your family, in your life. Yeah, yeah, the double shot, the double shot, the high. In the name of Jesus, in our complete obedience, something is gonna happen. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Yeah, the double shot, the double shot, the double shot, the high. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. In your complete obedience, I declare healing. I declare restoration. I declare breakthrough in your life right now.